Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for coming today. My name is Justin Florence. I'm one of the fellows here at the Center on National Security and the Law. And I'll be moderating the panel this afternoon on the national security law challenges that are facing a new presidential administration. As those of you who were here for this morning's panels, uh, which were terrific, heard, there's one great consensus uh, by both critics and defenders of the current administration, and that's the shared view that this administration is obsessed with the law in its response to 9-11. Critics believe that the administration is obsessed with finding a way to undermine and get around and distort the law, uh, while defenders of the administration believe that the policies that the administration has chosen uh, to enact after 9-11 are designed very much to uh, take in, into account the limits of the law. These are issues that, um, as not just matters of policy, but really matters of law, are going to necessarily confront any new administration because matters of policy and matters of law are so intertwined. And we have a really terrific panel here this afternoon uh, who will bring a great diversity of interests and expertise and experience uh, to bear on this issue. So I'm going to quickly introduce them all and then work to, uh, right into what I hope will be a uh, very and is Rosa Brooks, Rosa Brooks, who's a professor here at the Georgetown University Law Center. She's also a columnist for the Los Angeles Times and has written numerous scholarly articles on international law, human rights, terrorism, and the law of war, and has co-authored the book, Can Might Make Rights, The Rule of Law After Military Interventions. She previously taught at the law school at UVA, was a senior advisor at the State Department, and has worked with and human rights non-governmental organizations. Professor Brooks received her undergraduate degree from Harvard, a master's degree from Oxford, and her law degree from Yale. Sitting next to her is Judge Marcia Cook, who comes from, to us from the United States District Court for the Southern District of Florida. She received her commission in May 2004 and was quick, quickly brought into these issues when she was assigned to preside over the terrorism trial of Jose Padilla and two of his co-defendants. Before her appointment to the bench, Judge Cook had an extremely diverse career, including working as an assistant county attorney in Miami-Dade County for the governor of Florida, uh, for U.S. attorney's offices in both Michigan and Florida, and as a public defender, uh, and also, I believe, in private practice. So she is true from every side. She is a graduate of Georgia, and we welcome her back, and also of the Wayne State University Law School. Professor Rosen, uh, Jeffrey Rosen, teaches law at Washington University and is also the legal affairs editor of the New Republic. And he is one of our nation's most widely read and influential legal commentators. He, too, has written numerous articles and commentaries, as well as, I believe, four books on the courts, civil liberties, privacy, and security, uh, including most recently, and rivalries that defined America. Professor Rosen graduated from Harvard College, Oxford University, and also Yale Law School. And our final panelist this afternoon uh, is Patrick Rowan, who uh, has replaced Ken Weinstein on this panel as he has at the Justice Department. Mr. Rowan is the Acting Assistant Attorney General for National Security and leads the National Security Division at the, at the Justice Department. Before helping to establish the National Security Division, Mr. Rowan held a number of senior national security related positions in the department. He also served as an assistant U.S. attorney for the District of Columbia and was an associate at the D.C. law firm of Covington and Burling. Mr. Rowan graduated from Dartmouth College and from UVA Law School. Uh, before we dive in, I just want to note up front, as you've probably gathered from our panelists' biographies, some of them by the nature of their current positions and their current roles may be a little bit limited in what they can talk about. So I uh, will certainly try to respect that, and I hope that you all will as well. I would like to start our substantive discussion by talking about what has become at least a symbol of this administration's uh, approach to national security law and an issue that will certainly uh, be right at the forefront of things that the next administration has to deal with, and that is Guantanamo. And I'm hoping Mr. Rowan can start us off by talking a little bit about what this administration is currently doing, um, 
With respect to Guantanamo, I know that the president and other members of the administration, uh, in addition to all three of the remaining presidential candidates, have stated as a goal to close Guantanamo. And I'm curious um, what measures the current administration is taking to move us in that direction and what advice Mr. Rowan um, would give to the next administration that comes in on how we can go about doing that. Uh, well, I think, first of all, they shouldn't set any uh, time limits on how quickly they can close Gitmo. Um, uh, right now, uh, the, the administration is, is working on a number of fronts. Um, obviously, there's a group there uh, that they propose to charge in a military commission. Um, and you know, if that works out, goes correctly, and those people receive a sentence, that sentence could be served anywhere. Um, be over and above that group, uh, there's, I think there's probably about 270 people at, at Guantanamo now. Obviously, that population has been shrunk over time. Um, the the Department of Defense and the Department of State particularly have worked very hard to try to uh, repatriate those that can be repatriated. Um, uh, most of, uh, of that has, I think, already occurred. Um, there may be some folks left that, that are amenable to that kind of treatment sent back to the country of which they are a citizen. Um, in some instances, of course, there's um, uh, outstanding claims uh, by the detainees that they can't go back, and those are the subject of, of, of litigation. And so I think that kind of issue will always exist. There will always be some population at Guantanamo that will uh, resist, even if the government of the United States wants to send them back to their country, uh, that will resist going back. Um, that will be a, a difficult group to deal with uh, going on into the future. Um, and there's also going to be uh, that um, I think will be assessed as being too dangerous to be sent back to the country of which they are a citizen, perhaps in some instances because of the nature of, of the detainee and also in some instances the nature of the country that they're from and, and our concerns about uh, uh, the climate in that country. And so that group, I think, will remain, um, it, it may shrink, but there will remain a group that will, will fall into that category as well. So um, uh, closing uh, Guantanamo is, is clearly a goal that, that nearly everybody agrees with. Uh, the problem is, what are you going to do with the people that are there? And I, I, I do believe that that will continue to be a problem. Uh, there, there are, I think, too dangerous for uh, any president to, to easily and quickly say, oh, send them back to where they came from. So it's going to continue to be an issue, no matter how much will the next president has to close Guantanamo. He's he or she's going to have to figure out what to do with this group. Um, and obviously, uh, the, the next obvious alternative to the United States has some huge political problems as well as some legal problems associated with it. But that, I think, is going to be what the debate will be about when the next president comes into office. Can I just ask you one quick follow-up um, before moving on to some of our other panelists, which is just sort of as a matter of fact and current policy, to what extent is the administration continuing to bring new people, uh, new captives, into Guantanamo, or uh, do we have sort of a population that is only moving down? Um, I think as a, as a factual matter, there's been at least one, if not there's at least one detainee who, who um, I'm trying to remember exactly what the numbers are, but I believe there's been at least one detainee came, has been uh, uh, transferred there in, in the last eight months or so. The time tends to run together in my head, unfortunately, on this kind of issue. But so there was a, a guy who's considered a senior Al Qaeda figure who is um, down there and is being uh, reviewed to determine whether or not he can be prosecuted in the commissions. Um, I think. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the stated uh, policy is of the administration, but if you look at the numbers, it, it um, certainly is not, hasn't grown in a long, long time and is, is shrinking. Um, I think everybody recognizes uh, the, 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 the myriad of problems with, with having more people down at Gitmo. So, Professor Brooks, um, we've, you know, got all three of our current presidential candidates have said that they want to close Gitmo and close it quickly. Um, how do they go about doing that? What do they do with the people who are there now? And what do they do with future war on terror captives? 
Uh, I guess I don't see nearly as many barriers as Mr. Rowan sees to this. Uh, I think we can close it very quickly. I think we can transfer the remaining detainees to a secure facility inside the United States. Uh, I think that there are a number of possible uh, facilities that would serve, uh, including, uh, for instance, the uh, disciplinary barracks at Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, which is a maximum security facility which could have a capacity for uh, total capacity I think could house about 94 maximum security prisoners. I think we should begin the process quickly, of a, a better process for sorting out amongst the remaining detainees who should be sent home because they should never have been detained in the first place because they were not combatants and don't pose any significant threat, uh, who clearly were combatants and did pose some threat uh, but could nevertheless be sent home, uh, who should, who not only posed a threat but committed crimes for which they should be tried, in which case they should be either tried in the military court martial system or in federal court. Uh, and I think that, you know, the, the, the one thing I, I think other people have lots of things to say, the, the one sort of thorniest issue here, it seems to me, and the one on which I think there's, there's probably most misunderstanding, uh, relates to that category of teenies, detainees that Mr. Rowan mentioned and described as sort of too dangerous to let go, but people who can't be tried for one reason or another. I, I don't really understand that. Um, I, to me, it seems like if the, I mean, there, there's sort of two variants of that claim, I guess. I mean, one variant of the claim is, is that uh, there are people who can't be tried because there are such evidentiary problems that you wouldn't be able to convict them in U.S. federal court, perhaps because the evidence against them was uh, obtained through the use of uh, abusive interrogations. Um, you know, I, 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 I'd be very interested in hearing from Judge Cook about some of the kinds of challenges in federal courts on this kind of issue, but, but it actually seems to me that in most of these categories there is generally going to be enough evidence available to convict people who did serious things in federal court. Uh, I, I, the other category I think that people tend to be talking about is people where they haven't necessarily committed a crime that's a violation of the laws of war, but we just think they're dangerous because they're hostile to the United States and we think that given the opportunity, if we let them go back to their home country, you know, they, they might at some future point uh, do something like strap a bomb onto their back and attack U.S. interests or attack U.S. allies. And, and I think that, frankly, that to some extent, when, when, we, when we think about that, we have to weigh the undoubted risks that we might let some people go who are so angry at us by now, if they weren't when they started, um, who are so angry at us that they might go out and eventually commit a hostile act against the United States against the very significant risks to the United States of creating even more angry people who will go out and attack U.S. interests created by holding people indefinitely based on a vague fear of future dangerousness. And that, that, that's what worries me most about that kind of argument, I guess, is, is that, you know, you think about the uh, Petraeus counterinsurgency manual that uh, neither terrorist organizations nor insurgencies are static. There's not sort of a fixed supply of people out there who don't like us our actions have an effect on increasing or decreasing the supply of people out there who don't like us and our detention policy, interrogation policies. All of these things help, can help increase or decrease the number of people out there who don't like us. So whenever we try to say, well, here is, you know, here is Mohammed X sitting in Guantanamo, should we or should we not release him? And we say, well, you know, if we release him, there's a 20% chance that he might end up back with the Taliban or he might end up seeking out some Al-Qaeda group in Yemen or wherever it might be, taking up arms, he's a you know, 23-year-old guy, he might, up, he might end up t committing a hostile act against the U.S. We have to weigh that against the possibility that his continued detention, based on nothing more than future dangerousness, inspires five other guys, you know, other Mohammed X's out there to take up arms against the United States. My own perspective, frankly, is that the U.S. is losing far, far more than we're gaining by continuing to, de to detain people based on a vague notion of future dangerousness. Professor Rosen, do you think that this sort of outline of bringing people here, trying some, letting some go back home, is it generally workable? And do you want to comment on the Gitmo closing plan generally? 
thinking about the politics of it, I fear that it's much more complicated than even uh, Professor Brooks suggests. So how would you actually do this? Yes, you can move people to Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, and try to create categories. Some, the most dangerous, will be tried. Some will be sent home. And then there's this category of preventative detention. But in each of these categories, we're going to need some future congressional action to give the entire thing legitimacy. For the existing trials, these things are going to be so tainted. As you saw the newspaper this morning, uh, the ACLU gearing up with an army of lawyers to challenge the legitimacy of these tribunals at every level. Interestingly, I saw, weirdly, it was called the John Adams Liberty Project. I thought Adams, we know from this HBO special, sponsored the Alien and Sedition Act. It seems like a strange civil libertarian hero. But, uh, the, the, uh, but these existing trials are going to be very uh, tainted for all these reasons. And I think many sensible observers think uh, because the military commissions are on such shaky grounds for the reason that our honoree uh, Professor Katyal, uh, who, full disclosure, is my brother-in-law. Uh, I have the nepotism chair of national security studies for this uh, panel today. But one of, Neil's, one of Neil's great insights from the beginning of his heroic uh, fight against these tribunals is they couldn't have legitimacy without uh, congressional approval. And uh, ultimately, as he and uh, Jack Goldsmith, who you met this morning, argued, we really need uh, a congressional national security court. And we need a uh, congressional national security court both to oversee the procedures for the trial of the very small group of terrorists who must be uh, tried. That's the only way that those trials will have legitimacy. And we also need that court to identify this category of people who Professor Brooks uh, is uh, too shadowy in their threats to actually be criminally tried, but too dangerous to send back, and to set up some system of preventative detention. Now, I do think I disagree with Rosa, although I respect very much her effort to try to calibrate the costs of detention politically against the cost of setting people free. How on earth would we measure that? I mean, it's, it's almost uh, as difficult as to measure the uh, success in uh, the fact that uh, in, in preventing future attacks. My sense, along with Neil and Jack, is that uh, all the European countries that have dealt with terrorism since 9-11 and before have a system of preventative detention. Uh, when you look at the Gitmo detainees, uh, Ben Wittes, in his very important uh, new book, uh, which I happen to have here, and we'll plug for the cameras, Law and the Long War, a kind of moderate approach to what this system would look like, estimates that about 30 percent of the current Gitmo detainees uh, are extremely dangerous either by their own admission, because they've said they are, uh, or by other evidence. And uh, many of these people cannot be tried uh, criminally. They've vague conspiracies, uh, a desire to do future harm, but not really possible to try them. So for them, preventative detention does seem to make sense to me, and you need congressional endorsement. Now I want to say, just think about the politics of this. So President Obama or Clinton or McCain comes in, and say it's President Obama, and he has just been so eloquent on the campaign trail. I couldn't believe it when I heard him in New Hampshire. We are going to close Guantanamo. We are going to restore habeas corpus. Who could imagine a presidential candidate saying such a thing uh, in the pre-9-11 uh, era? But even with the best intentions in the world, you close Guantanamo, you move everyone to Kansas, and then you actually have to go to Congress which is all fired up, as it were, with uh, civil libertarian enthusiasm, and you say to Congress, create a national security court and a system of preventative detention, that kind of moderate compromise, although people like Neil and Jack and all sorts of, and Ben Wittes uh, think that liberals and conservatives can converge around this, there's no political constituency for this moderate compromise. And we know this because when the Patriot Act came up for renewal, and people like uh, Russ Feingold and uh, others on the right proposed the SAFE Act, which would have given the government broad investigatory powers in exchange for requiring high degrees of individualized suspicion, they, uh, the deal didn't go through because the national security liberals and conservatives don't want to give anything to the civil liberty side, and the civil libertarians on the left and on the right don't trust the government enough to st st uh, strike the compromise. So I fear, look, the disagreement that uh, Rose and I were having, if we kept talking, maybe I'm sure she might convince me of this as she does of everything. But uh, I, I just, even with the best will in the world, I'm having trouble imagining how Guantanamo is closed, given the need for congressional oversight, how 
could a President Obama or a Clinton or even a McCain enlist the political capital that would create the oversight that would allow for effective trials and effective detention to take place. So in short, this seems to be a, pr a problem with a clear hypothetical solution, but one that may be very politically difficult to achieve. So, Judge Cook, I want to turn to you now um, and ask you to talk about two things um, which, which may be distinct and, and both I'm sure you would have a lot to say on. The first is the assumption undermining or underlaying a lot of the proposals for some sort of national security court or for even the Bush administration military detention policy is that trials of terrorists in civilian courts are not possible or not feasible. Um, and you actually um, are, are maybe the only judge who has actually overseen the criminal prosecution of a former enemy combatant or a former uh, asserted enemy combatant. And so I hope that you can talk about um, whether you think this sort of criminal civilian trials are possible and what some of the challenges to that are. Um, and then after that, I'd like to get your take on a national security court idea and what role federal judges might play in that. Um, and I understand that you may um, want to talk about this at a level of generality, not involving specific cases or individuals. Well, well, we'll talk about what you know. I know, and it's, it's available in the in the media as well. Is when you say I'm the only person who's done X, that's because, as far as we know, there's only one X. There's only one X factor of um, Jose Padilla, as far as we know, the only United States citizen held as an enemy combatant and detained for over three years, if my, if my math serves me correctly. Um, I'll talk about what I can see as the things that work well in my trial and the things that I see that might be issues as you go forward. First of all, there, the government in United States versus Jose Padilla did not seek to admit any of the, if there was any that existed, any information gathered while Mr. Padilla was designated as an enemy combatant. So none of that information was in the trial, was used as evidence, so that is, that's on one side of the table. The second part was that there were available, there was available as evidence intercepted conversations as you would have in any criminal trial. So that allowed you to have the same kind of evidentiary discussions where you would have around any sort of wiretap criminal trial. The next level is what do you do when you do have classified information? And I believe, and I think my trial points it out, and it's not easy, is that you do have this layer of protection using the SEPA law, which allows you to have judicial intervention between the government and the defense to talk about those, that type of information that is deemed classified. And you do have, I think, an excellent backdrop, and not to pat our judicial colleagues on the back, but that is where you have the backstop, and that is that you have judges acting as referees between the two competing camps. The defense that says, give us everything, and the government that says, give us nothing, and the government recognizing that if the judge agrees with the defense that this information should be declassified and turned over, the government is facing a situation where they have no case, because they may have to agree to have their case dismissed. They don't want the evidence to be turned over. What, where I see, or what can be problematic in that situation is, is that we are relying on... I was just going to interject for a second. Um, <laughs> we are relying, when I say we, I mean the court system is relying on the government telling us what the finite set of SEPA information is that we are to determine exists. Let me just interject there that SEPA is the Classified Information Procedures Act, which is a, a law guiding the handling of classified evidence in criminal trials. So. And the next backdrop is, is very often, and um, the actual owner of the information is not the Justice Department, for lack of a better term. So you are trying to determine, through this second layer, you have the defense that says, Judge, I need X. You go to the Justice Department and say, the defendant says, I need X, 
and the Justice Department has to go to another agency to say, I need X. And that's where the determination of whether or not something is going to be declassified. And you could have a situation where the Justice Department lawyers think this information ought to be declassified and or this information should be discoverable. And you may have a situation where the so-called owner of the information says no. So that's where I see a possible competing interest. And the other one is the obvious evidentiary one, and that flows from what we normally think of in any criminal trial, and that's the issue of how we treat so-called co-conspirator statements. Because so very often, our evidentiary rulings are made from the backdrop of what we think happens among, for lack of a better word, normal criminal participants. And very often in these kinds of situations, we aren't dealing with the quote-unquote normal criminal conspiracy participants, we're probably dealing with other, for lack of a better identifiable term, enemy combatants. Can I ask just to follow up a sort of more human question about these types of trials, which is that one of the um, concerns raised about the idea of trying terrorists is just the toll it takes on federal judges and the judiciary and, and the resources. Um, did you feel that uh, federal judges are well equipped in terms of staff and resources and time to handle these types of trials? Or if we were s uh, to start to do this on a larger scale where instead of one judge in one district having one of these cases there all over the country, we would need a sort of restaffing or? I, I think that the present situation allows for the judges to adequately deal with it. Is it exhausting and demanding? The answer to that question is definitely yes. I mean, we spent two months almost just merely in jury selection, and we're not even talking about what went on before in terms of the pretrial motion classified hearing. But I'm a proponent of public trials. I'm a proponent of Article Three judges doing the public trials. And I'm not saying, and you know, when the Supreme Court finally issues the mandate and everybody can see what I did wrong, I'm not saying I necessarily did this one right, but I'm just saying that it can be done. And for some of the reasons that you just heard at lunch, why, at lunch why, I why I think it's important. It's interesting that everyone focuses on Jose Padilla in terms of the three individuals that were prosecuted in my court. And that's because he's obviously the one that's the most well known. But I think the other reason why you have this overwhelming interest in Mr. Padilla is he's the one who we don't know what happened to this pre-enemy combatant sort of status. And I think we as Americans, whether you're a lawyer or not, are just kind of suspicious of things that go on behind closed doors. And you had the other two individuals who were very much treated like normal criminal defendants. You know, they were indicted, they were arraigned, they had detention hearings, and all of their criminal problems were aired out publicly. And that gives the American populace a feeling of confidence, because that's what we're used to. And I think that judges know what to do, hopefully, um, will we'll read the law, we'll interpret it as best we can, and I think it's important for us to understand that's the role of the judiciary, is public trials and access to our tribunals. So I wonder if um, Mr. Rowan and Professor Rosen, in light of those comments, can talk about why they think either um, civilian trial is not an option or we need some alternative national security court procedure, given the success the government's had in its prosecution before Judge Cook? Um, well, uh, the, the 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 notion of a national security court. I mean, I think the the single greatest advantage that a national security court would have over the military commission system is the the presence of a, an experienced federal judge at the middle of the whole thing. Um, the the judges in the military commissions process are, uh, to the extent they've had an opportunity to perform, um, they're, they're fine judges, but the, the military system doesn't uh, um, sort of 
create the conditions where uh, you have judges who have had to deal with extremely complex and arduous litigation over years and years. And so I think that, that that's one of the significant benefits that we would realize if we had something like a national security court. Um, I, I do think that those proceedings are hard on the federal judiciary to just you know, you walk into the courthouse and all of a sudden the judge is dealing in a world where everything has to be done in a skiff. His law clerks need to be cleared. He's got defense attorneys telling him, Judge, I got to go to Pakistan to interview witnesses and I've got to hire Blackwater to protect me and I need you to sign the vouchers on this. I mean, it is a, it's a, it is a different kind of beast than, than a lot of the cases federal judges see. And so I can see that, that in that context as well, something like a national security court where there is an infrastructure in place for these cases to be litigated would would be of some substantial advantage um, but after you kind of think about having experienced judges and hardened courthouses and budgets that would permit these kinds of trials do you you really then need to talk about whether or not you're going to um, change the procedural rules in a way that would permit um, cases to go forward that, that can't go forward now. And I think particularly the hearsay rules are, are the single hardest part. The, 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 um, I think the, this, the rules for protecting classified information in the military commissions as, as stated in the Military Commissions Act are not terribly different from SEPA. I think the biggest thing is, is the uh, uh, more flexible uh, rules for admitting um, you know, testimony or, or admitting hearsay uh, information. Uh, and that's something that would need to be a piece of this if it was ever to be a, a serious competitor to the military commissions for trying people where a lot of the information we have doesn't come to us in a form where we can call a live witness to testify. Can I just add one, something about the, the format and um, understand, I'm not speaking from any policy standpoint here. I'm talking about my experience one case and what happened to me, and I think that's very important for everyone to understand, particularly from a judicial perspective. But, you know, the lawyers in my case did go to Pakistan. The lawyers in my case ended up having to go to Afghanistan. Four or five of my lawyers were caught, when I say my lawyers, I mean the lawyers in my case, were caught in Lebanon during the Lebanese war. I mean, so it's, it's doable, it's hard, it hurts. I mean, it hurts in the sense that very few things that you have to do that are good for you are easy. You know, it's like flossing. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know you need to do it. You know there's a procedure to do it, and you know at the end of it, the, it, it is going to be a much more positive cost-benefit analysis. The, the trouble is, Judge, that with full uh, respect for your achievement and your excellent metaphor of uh, flossing, e e even if we assume that all judges were as good as you and could do the trials as well, uh, there's this large category of detainees who can't be dealt with under the existing system. So we have these military commissions, and these military commissions are completely discredited, and they will be tied up in knots for 10 years, as the ACLU told the New York Times this morning, given the tremendous shortcuts and problems with the way they were established, the treatment of evidence, and so forth. So something has to be done to substitute those military commissions, and it's obviously not the case that everyone at Guantanamo can either be freed or tried before a military commission. Some of the people who are currently charged under the military tr commissions are not really appropriate for criminal trials. Uh, Hamdan, uh, uh, Osama bin Laden's alleged driver, who Professor Kachel uh, so ably represented before the Supreme Court, is not a natural uh, candidate to be transferred to an ordinary criminal trial. So that's why, again, e even giving full marks to federal judges um, in the cases in which they've been asked to perform, you need first a national security court uh, to substitute for the current military commissions. Then you need a national security court also to uh, re-examine all of the status determinations of the uh, combatant status review tribunals and decide who's really dangerous and who's not. And without a legitimacy to that sort of review process, no amount of fiddling with the Guantanamo process is going to have any legitimacy at all. So that has to be done as well. And then finally, you need a national security court to decide what to do about that category that Rosa and I were discussing. Um, whether you want preventative detention, 
uh, or whether you actually want to try every single potentially dangerous combatant uh, before some sort of uh, newly created national security court, you'd need a mechanism for doing that. Now, uh, Mr. Rowan was right that there'd be a lively debate about what the rules of evidence in these various bodies would be. And Neil uh, Catchell and Jack Goldsmith proposed lower uh, rules of evidence for national security courts than ordinary criminal trials. You don't want to release a detainee because he wasn't read Miranda rights on the battlefield. He'd have access to lawyers, but maybe wouldn't have to meet with them immediately. There might be some differences in the classified rules. This could all be open for debate. And I can imagine if Congress were in a really civil libertarian mood and a President Obama or Clinton wanted not to cut corners, you could create most of the procedures in these new uh, national security courts that ordinary criminal trials have. You wouldn't have to dilute it all that much. Another interesting uh, way of giving them legitimacy would be to bring in international agreement. And John McCain has talked about going to the European allies and talking about the ways in which uh, the Geneva Convention would apply to these new bodies. That could give them legitimacy, too. So lots of room for debate. But all, all that I'm saying is that while completely respecting the, and let's face facts, our Article Three judiciary is the crowning achievement of American government. They're excellent people like Judge Cook, and they do a really conscientious, good job. Judge Mukasey, now the Attorney General, did a good job in his uh, trial, of the, 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 the initial uh, trial of Padilla. But that doesn't solve the political problem and the legal problem that we have from all these people who uh, are detained in these uh, tribunals and settings without legitimacy. And I just can't see any way of dealing with that problem without some kind of congressional endorsement of a national security court. You know, Jeff, um, I'm going to try to persuade you uh, that that a lot of these I mean, you, your, your initial response uh, to the framework I laid out was, was that I was making it sound too easy, and in fact it was very complicated, but, but I think that a lot of these complications are ones that, that are being created that don't need to be created. You know, I, I, I think that we, we've got a system that works pretty darn well, and it's called the federal courts, you know, not that there are no problems. You know, not that maybe, maybe SEPA, the Classified Information Protection Act, needs to be modified in certain respects, maybe. You know, maybe you need to get Congress to twiddle with it. You know, maybe you want to think about doing something like directing most of these cases to some particular federal circuit. I don't know. You know, there, but these things can be dealt with. It's not that complicated. I think are, you're absolutely right that when President Obama or Clinton or McCain comes in, if they go to Congress and say, "Hey, I'm closing Guantanamo. I'm transferring all these folks to Fort Leavenworth, uh, and I want you to have, a, I want you to authorize the create, pass legislation authorizing the creation of a national security court and uh, preventive detention," that Congress is going to go, "Ho, ho, wait a second. But that's because you don't need to do that, and you shouldn't do that. We should not have indefinite preventive detention. Sure, there are states that have had short, temporary periods of preventive detention. We've, we've been preventively detaining people now for years, and we're proposing to do it forever. We don't need to do that. That's not our interest. We don't need to turn our judicial, our court system on its head to deal with 50 or 60 individuals, most of whom are not that much of a menace to the United States of America. We are not in that much danger from these individuals, again, because I think you have to weigh it. At, you know, and of course, you can't have any precise quantification of this, but you have to weigh it against the terrible, terrible damage that has been done and is, and is ongoing to our national security interests that come from uh, the image of the United States looking like we, we are just thrown the rule of law out the window. You know, I. I I think that without it, without at all disputing the notion that there might be some fixes that we need to make to address issues of evidence that needs to remain classified, to work on the interagency cooperation system, some of the issues that Judge Cook referenced of cooperation between the Justice Department and other executive branch agencies in terms of who wants to have control and ownership over the evidence. Those are all, those are all tough issues. But I just, I, I can't see that any of this requires turning our system on its head in terms of the question of do we need a national security court to sort out which of these, to, to, to review the combatant status review tribunal determinations. I think if these folks are transferred to locations in the United States, we have a mechanism called habeas corpus. 
just in the spirit of being persuaded, and I agree with you already that indefinite detention overseen by a national security court doesn't seem uh, plausible. And most of the models, I think, envision very peri periodic review and not lasting forever. But what do you do with, uh, Wittes has their names, I don't uh, have them close to hand. There are a whole bunch of people who in their combatant status review tribunals at Guantanamo said, I hate America, I want to blow it up. If you get me out, I'm going to blow you up. But they haven't done anything okay. yet. A different hypothetical. No, I accept it. It's, it. Let's say it's completely real. I agree. No, no, these guys are saying street in any of 20 countries in the world, and in 10 minutes, I could find you 50 other young guys who say, I hate America. I want to blow it up. Should we, should, should we try our best to pick up all those people and detain them, detain them indefinitely? We cannot have a policy that is premised on indefinite detention of everybody who says, I hate America, I'd like to do it harm, because we would be detaining millions and millions of people. But these people were caught on the battlefield often and went to Al-Qaeda uh, training camps. So what do you actually do with them? Do you say we should send in those some guys cases, back? Yes, in some cases, no. I mean, we, you know, <laughs> I mean if you want to talk what about... What about the no's? What do you do to the people who you don't? And you can't try them criminally. I mean, I don't think anyone disputes... Which that people are we talking about? Though. People who say I want to blow up America, who are caught in these bad circumstances, they've been transferred to Fort Leavenworth, they can't go to Judge Cook's courtroom because they don't even meet the standards of criminal conspiracy, but they're undoubtedly dangerous. What do you do with them? I, th I think that you, you, it, you have to do it on a case-by-case -case basis, but I think one of the things that you do, that you make appropriate arrangements with the country that you're turning them over to for continued detention, for continued monitoring and so forth, I think that's something that we can do, that many of the countries that we're, you know, we have done that in some cases. You know, the Saudi government has a program, I believe it's the Saudi government, that is a sort of a, a halfway house between Guantanamo and actual release that sort of works to de-extremize people and have ongoing monitoring. To some extent, though, you assume a certain level of risk, and again, you have to balance it against the risk to U.S. security interests of continuing to detain people who haven't actually done anything. So, Judge Cook, let me step in and ask you if... Um President Obama did somehow go and convince Congress to enact some sort of national security court that used Article III federal judges. Do you think the federal judges you know would be comfortable presiding over these sorts of either military type trials or preventive detention type procedures um, that are so different from our kind of traditional civilian constitutional trials? Um, is, that a, is that a role that federal judges would would welcome playing. That's a difficult one. I, I, I'm, I'm really pausing because I think I can only speak from my own experience. And the second one is, I think the obvious one that we discussed at lunch today, and I think we are all looking for, or we are all mindful of what we think of as a traditional United States does justice system, you know, due process, notice, an opportunity to defend, compulsory process, confronting your witness, confronting your witnesses, you know, witnesses against you, you know, the ability to access information. So I think you have to look at all of those kind of triptychs before you're talking about a justice system. And I think those I mean, I, I don't want to be for or against because I don't think that's my role today. But I think if you go down that litany, aren't you in federal court? I mean, if you talk about due process, notice, an opportunity to defend, confronting your witnesses, access to discoverable information, a neutral arbiter between the sides. I mean, I think you're talking about the court system that we probably have. I, I do understand that there's a tension and a legal one that I don't have a solution to, and it, the biggest one that's obvious is the access to, to evidence and how you treat what we think of in court systems as hearsay information, what we think of when we think of as an unavailable witness. You know, when we talk about these traditional no notions trustworthiness within a, within a statement that allows you to have comfort that even though the witness isn't here and capable of being cross-examined, that you're going to have reliance on that statement. But I, those are, I'm thinking as a judge, when I'm looking at someone saying objection hearsay and I'm going down my, my list in my head, those are things that are, 
that concern. I think concern everyone. And I think that's why you two are, are locked in this very, I feel like I should move <laughs> my chair over here. No, it's good we're keeping you, you there as a judge. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and let them have this discussion. So before we leave this topic, I'm curious, Mr. Rowan, I know that um, the Attorney General is one of the folks who has suggested in writing some sort of new congressionally authorized hybrid preventive detention national security court system, and is there any chance that the current administration, before it leaves, will go to Congress and ask for something like this to put um, detainees on a more solid legal footing? Um, I, I don't know of any plans to do so at present. We're, we're focused, focused on immunity for telecoms. Um, I, I actually think w one of the interesting things that in, in hearing Professor Brooks talk about, you know, the, the risk here and, and, and thinking about the judges, part of, on a personal level, part of the difficulty here is you have people at first at Guantanamo and then in the, the, the Pentagon who are the ones called upon to sign their name to the piece of paper that says, yes, even though he says he did six months of bomb making training and he wants to kill America, we don't have a, 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 a a reason to hold him and we're going to send him back to a country that's known to have porous borders. Um, I, 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 mean, I would like to see uh, somebody higher in the chain have their name signed to those sorts of decisions. If it's a federal judge, then, then great. They need to be given some pretty clear standards upon which to operate when they make those decisions. But, you know, the risk of, of uh, you know, the, the, the anger that we may be creating, creating in some parts of the world by running Guantanamo. It, I, I certainly understand the point, but the, the guy at Gon Guantanamo, the sailor down there, or his officer, he's not, that's, he's not on the hook for that. He is on the hook for a judgment about an individual who then, five years later, blows up something. I'd like to try and sort of broaden out our conversation a little bit beyond detainees in Guantanamo, and, and that's sort of a good transition, the, the idea of having a federal judge sort of sign off on some of these decisions. So I'd like to sort of ask the panelists about whether they, what role they think courts generally will play on national security issues in the next administration. So many of the Bush uh, administration policies have ended up in court, whether on detainees or surveillance or rendition or even now torture. Um, are we gonna continue to see a lot of uh, issues of policy end up in federal court or will that tail off? And, and is that a good thing for judges to get their hands on these issues? You know what's so uh, frustrating? When you think about a good system where you didn't have programs tied up in knots because they were sloppily constructed or because an administration unnecessarily refused to get congressional support and so forth, uh, most of the well-designed systems require the kind of compromise that I began by saying is not likely to happen. So take uh, surveillance, foreign intelligence surveillance. Uh, the moderate position is the one that the Europeans have adopted. You give the intelligence service broad discretion to surveil without individualized suspicion, but you can only use that evidence for people who are very serious terrorists or criminals and not lower level criminals. The Germans do this and it's called the control use model. It's a bargain that's struck between the state and the uh, civil liberties community. Uh, uh, you, you can imagine uh, in, a, in an ideal world such a system being adopted. It would solve all of the problems that are currently bandied about, about FISA being inadequate to the situation. But again, there's no political constituency for it. What makes it even harder uh, to construct is it would require a role for judges, but only at the margin. So judges would oversee the system and decide, is there a circumstance under which uh, anonymized data is being surveilled? There's, uh, we're so convinced that it's linked to a dangerous individual that we can de-anonymize it and actually link it. And you'd go to a judge and say, uh, judge, here's the standard of cause, will you create it? But imagine the com it was complex to talk about the National Security Court, and Rosa and I had this disagreement, and we had this nice discussion. Imagine the complexity of both this political bargain where you get to surveil, but only for intelligence, not criminal purposes, and then the exception that you create this oversight court where you have to go to a judge to de-anonymize with a high level of suspicion. It's, never, it's not going to happen. And I say this with frustration, because in my idealistic moments in the wake of 9-11, you know, I was a among those who was, were endorsing these sort of situations. But when I look at the way these debates uh, progress, 
it's unlikely to happen. Now, one ray of hope, and I hope I'm not proselytizing. It is true that in his uh, uh, book, The Audacity of Hope, there's a chapter on constitutional law that Barack Obama wrote, and he talks about seeing the Constitution not as something to be imposed from above by judges, but something that comes up from below through a conversation among different points of view. And that was what defined his approach as a constitutional law teacher, and it defined his approach to civil liberties in the Illinois legislature, where he brought prosecutors and defense people together, and they videotaped interrogations and uh, confessions. And that was a real reform. Maybe, I mean, it would be such a change in our political debate, but if you had a committed president who really did want to bring both people together, maybe it's not beyond the realm of possibility that you could construct these new systems where judges are operating really at the margins, just overseeing the procedures, not making substantive decisions centrally about when and who people are surveilled. But it would be a level of political achievement that this country has not seen for an awfully long time, and uh, unfortunately, I'm not betting on it. On this, I actually completely agree with Jeff. I and mean, one of the things that's that, I, in terms of what we're likely to see in the next administration, you know, on the one hand, we're going to have all this litigation. It's not going to go away. It's going to wend its way through the courts for the next 73 years or something until you know the last defendant and defense lawyer and prosecuting lawyer drop dead of old age. Um, but but that said, I I, I, I think that. It is actually possible that any of the current top presidential contenders, I, I think, are quite likely to approach all of these issues with a uh, somewhat different spirit than the current administration certainly started out with, and, and, and be a little bit more inclined to go to Congress and say, you know, let's see if we can sit down. I, I mean, I'm a little more optimistic than you are, uh, Jeff, that, that there's going to be a bit more of a spirit of, of compromise, and everybody knows that these issues are tough. Everybody knows that, you know, security is important. Everybody knows that civil liberties are important. Let's think about what we have to do to get this right. Let's think about how we build in some self, you know, I, I think that most Ameri you know, I, I don't think that there's anybody Amer in America, including the most sort of hardcore ACLU types, who don't say, yeah, you know, I don't mind short-term temporary liberty, inf liberty infringements as long as there is some correction mechanism, as long as if a really bad screw up is made, I can get it fixed. You know, and I don't think even the hard, most hardcore security people, if you put them in a room and can talk reasonably, would say, yeah, there, what's so wrong with that? That doesn't hurt us. We can do that. We can come up with something. So I, I'm actually kind of optimistic that we might be able to craft some solutions on these issues that would minimize future litigation. And one of the things that's always, frankly, baffled me as well as really saddened me because I think it's had tragic consequences uh, both in terms of uh, U.S. political culture and frankly in terms of our, in terms of undermining our national security more generally is, is why the administration early on didn't, didn't do a little bit more of that. I mean so much of what happened did seem just both overbroad and cobbled together and, and we're still, you know, the next president is going to have to spend a lot of time digging him or herself out of the hole that we're in. So, Judge Cook, I wonder if um, you could give us the judicial perspective on how um, judges feel when they have these sort of weighty issues of national security that, that come up in the clue where the government, which maybe has more knowledge and more expertise on the national security impl uh, implications of something, is, is warning, you know, if you, if you do this, this horrible thing is going to happen to our country. Um, is that a role judges feel comfortable? being in, or, or would judges be very happy to, to have these cases disappear? I don't think we'd be happy to have them disappear, because I think what it shows is we live in a society and it's functioning where you have tension on both sides, and the person that's calling the balls and calling the strikes is the judiciary, which is the way the system is supposed, supposed to function. What happens is, unfortunately, is regardless of the decision, you're cast in the light that somehow you sided with one side over the other in kind of a policy or political vein when you are, I think most of the time, judges are following what they think um, the law is. Often, no matter where you are in a criminal law debate, whether it's national security or the debate on you know, crack cocaine sentencing, there's always that parade of horribles that one side or the other gives you. You know, that this step opens the dike and the flood is, you know, afterwards. And I think what you understand is that's very rarely the case. Um, I think what we would like very often to have from a judicial standpoint is time. I mean, when you think about 
these issues and you're going through them, we are facing the regular time frames that you face whenever you talk about criminal defendants. And the biggest one is time, that someone is being detained and we kind of have rules and regulations for how that's supposed to be from you know the date of indictment till you actually start a jury trial and and that's probably the luxury we don't have I mean I'm glad I'm surrounded by academics and probably one day in the near future I'm gonna get or have to call one of you about something and discuss it with you but that's what we don't have the luxury of the academic debate you know very often I mean we're dealing in a situation now where someone's making an argument to us, let's say, about the how far do you want to push the envelope on the, the unavailability rule and trustworthiness for hearsay? Where is that line? You know, we're there, we're now, we're in court. It'd be great if I could get you all together and we could have a nice evidentiary discussions about the true outlines of reliability and hearsay, but we don't always have that. And I think that's where the difficulty comes but I think judges, for the most part, my colleagues, welcome the challenge, we welcome the intellectual exercise, and we welcome the role that we perform in um, a free society. And, and we want that, and I think that's why, that's what we all signed up for in the first place. Mr. Rowan, I wonder if you could um, sort of give an administration perspective on, on the role the judiciary has played um, since 9-11 and will continue to play, do you think uh, that, that judges have sort of overstepped their expertise at all by getting involved in some decisions that would best have been uh, deferred to the political branches or, um, or are you and, and the administration more generally comfortable with the role the judiciary has been playing? No, I'm, I'm not comfortable sort of speaking on behalf of the administration on such a, a broad point, but I can tell you that um, you know, as it stands right now, I, I think judges have, um, by and large, in, in the sort of cases that I'm thinking about in the context of the terrorist surveillance program and other significant national security issues, they have, um, I think, demonstrated um, a, a fair degree of respect for um, the executive's sort of uh, need to, to have the lead on national security issues and to make judgments. Um, I do worry, though, with um, some of the legislative proposals in different areas, with a lot of the talk on the Hill generally, that what you suggested, which is, well, there's room for a model where the judge is, is just sort of out there at the edge, kind of keeping an eye on the general process or procedures, that that's not really the trend. Um, it seems like so much of what we talk about, you know, certainly in the post 9-11 debate has been, well, we got to get the judges right in the middle of this. Um, you know, if it's, it's it, what might have been thought of in general as an intelligence matter, but we're not happy with how we uh, on the Hill can conduct oversight, so we're going to put the judges into the middle of this. And so I do think there's a risk that you will more and more find judges being put into positions where they've got this lengthy affidavit from the intelligence community and they're in a difficult position of having to weigh uh, how much you know credit to give that declaration when it's not their experience. They you know um, I, I think some of them have, have done extraordinary jobs handling those kind of issues, but in part because it's a tradition that the the judiciary defers to the executive on on like sort of core judgments about what the national security requires. Just to support. Mr. Rowan's point, uh, but you've complicated things even more, and now you've made me even more depressed because the optimistic story is the reason judges have been inserting themselves too much post 9-11 is because of the executive's overly broad claims of uh, unilateral authority. So the judges get their backs up and the Supreme Court says, no, you can't keep us out of the loop. We're going to make up the procedures uh, in the Hamdi case and require some degree of due process. And the optimistic story says if Congress actually asserted itself, 
in conjunction with enlightened presidential leadership, then judges could step aside to the margins and do the thing that I think both you and I think they might uh, do better uh, at. But then you say, no, no, there's this additional problem. Congress likes to pass the buck. And even if President McCain or Obama or Clinton goes to Congress and says, create a national security court or create this FISA oversight system, it's easier for the Congress people to, to say, no, let judges decide. This is embodied in one of the more unfortunate moments in the post 9-11 debate, remember when Senator Specter, who's so good and thoughtful on so many of these issues, said, I believe that the Military Commissions Act is unconstitutional in that it uh, suspends habeas corpus, but I'm going to vote for it anyway and let the judges sort it out. And that's just a terrible example of buck passing. You suggest it's rampant, and that means that the task may be even harder than we initially thought. All right. I wonder if we can um, sort of fully move into predicting the future mode, and we've talked a lot about surveillance, a lot of, about detention, which are the issues that I think have most dominated debate over the past six or seven years. What are the issues, I wonder if everybody can uh, maybe chime in on, that aren't really so much in the, in the public debate yet or, or broadly in the public debate that a next president is going to have to spend a lot of time and energy dealing with um, in this general area of national security law? Gosh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll just throw out one, and, and this is one that I don't think has really been on our national security law radar screens a whole lot, um, but, and, and, but maybe it ought to be. Um, uh, what about bio, bioterrorism-related issues and public health-related issues? Uh, uh, you know, one of the uh, things that I can get very paranoid about when I wake up in the middle of the night. It's actually not even just bioterrorism, frankly, right? It could be a naturally occurring public health crisis. We, we all know from our, our experience a couple of years ago with the flu vaccine that our current public health system and healthcare system is not even very good at dealing with a, a pretty trivial uh, health problem. Um, we don't we certainly don't have the legal framework in place to deal with any much, much more serious, fast-spreading, fast potentially lethal kind of health crisis. Uh, I, I actually think that that's, that's the kind of issue that, given, the, given globalization, given, given air travel, given migration, given climate change, which is going to spur even more migration and is going to cause all sorts of, I'm not a scientist, but weird stuff going on with species and germs, um, take my word for it, um, uh, that I don't understand. Um, you know, this is serious stuff, and because it's a little further away and it's, it's harder to visualize than a single terrorist attack, does pose very, very serious potential threats to not only U.S. security, but, but global security, human security. And, and although I know that there are folks out there who think a lot about this, I think that the national security law community has not thought a whole lot about it. And, 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 and it certainly poses some very similar kinds of civil liberties ish versus security trade-offs, including ones where there's no question, nobody disputes at all that some of the civil liberties costs would be borne by totally innocent people, you know, people who are, your, you, when you're talking about potentially quarantines and so forth. And I think that that's a, a, a debate that as we enter a world in which we are facing that kind of threat at more as a greater and greater statistical likelihood uh, of emerging diseases and so forth, whether caused by bioterrorism or natural causes, that we need to start having that national conversation and begin to start developing some kind of uh, agreed upon framework for what are we going to do in that situation? Because right now, it, it would be a complete train wreck. This, this is my favorite uh, topic, the, the futurology stuff, so I'll set out my favorite uh, uh, future debate, uh, predictive surveillance. Think of all, I shouldn't be grinning with such uh, pleasure at it because it's really troubling, but it's so interesting. And think of the many ways that it could well present itself over the next decade. So brain scan technologies uh, that set up friend or foe scanners. You show someone a picture of the battlefield in Afghanistan. If he's been there, his brain lights up in a certain way. If he hasn't, he's freed. And this is the basis for preventative detention with or without a national security court. A little bit further down the road, uh, trying to predict future behavior and future dangerousness based on the architecture of your amygdala and your prefrontal cortex, maybe a little bit more sci-fi, but it's being used in death penalty cases already as a form of uh, at, at, at sentencing, 
My amygdala made me do it. You could well see this in the terrorism arena. Uh, DNA databases, this is not sci-fi. The FBI, as we speak, is debating whether or not to do what Britain now does and engage in familial searches. So you uh, have a DNA sample at the crime scene, plug it into the database, see that it doesn't exactly match someone who's in the database, but it matches nearly enough that you're pretty sure that one of his or her relatives committed the crime. So then you go to that person and interview him and then uh, lock up his relatives based on his dangerousness. It really challenges the idea that you're, res that you're uh, responsible for what you do, not for what you think. You're, you're essentially at a higher degree of suspicion because of who you are, because of your DNA. Uh, and uh, uh, you can imagine lots. And finally, uh, data mining. Is, engaging, is, is progressing in all sorts of interesting ways. The internet service providers in Britain are just beginning to engage in direct uh, keystroke monitoring. So instead of sending you ads based on your general web behavior, they're basically monitoring every single uh, click that you make, possibly in personally identifiable ways, and sending you ads. You can use the same technology for the government to send a FBI agent to your door if you're clicking on explosives. Uh, the pressures between uh, the public uh, sector, the FBI and law enforcement, and the private se sector financial incentives to create these partnerships with the government are so strong that even civil libertarian-minded presidents uh, w will uh, not know where to come down. And maybe I'll end that thought by saying, our last Democratic president, for all of his uh, many virtues, was no civil libertarian. And uh, President Clinton, again, as Wittes uh, shows in this book, endorsed many of the uh, methods from rendition to pre-Patriot Act-like authorities that after 9-11 were expanded to terrorism. So whether it's uh, a Democratic president or a more libertarian-minded one like McCain, not at all obvious given the political realities in America, which tends to support more authority, not less, that these predictive surveillance technologies are actually going to be uh, uh, stopped in a thoughtful way. Can I just, I think it was a country and western song, you know, the freedom ain't free. Um, it's, these trials are expensive. Um, no matter good, bad, wherever you fall out on the line, um, it costs a lot to um, secure a courthouse, um, to provide um, access to witnesses, um, to provide, um, and this is on both sides, I mean, whether you're the United States Attorney's Office who has a budget of X for all your criminal trials for the year, and you're now dealing with one trial that it basically may be your travel budget for three years, um, or exhibits and tapes and copying and access that if we want to have a truly functioning judiciary, like so much of our government, we have to recognize that um, it's not cheap. Uh, I mean, I don't know that this is a new issue, but I think it, it's going to become more and more a subject of discussion is sort of on an international lever, level, um, the sort of cyber terrorism issues, which is that, you know, the internet is the new battleground. Uh, uh, it's the, the new tool for radicalization. It's where uh, all the information is being carried. The, the, the servers are all over the world. Uh, countries are going to need to be able to work out what they can do um, against a server in another country. Um, and, and, you know, blocking and a lot of other things that, you know, is sort of domestically we certainly think of as being uh, at, at odds with, with First Amendment protections. But, um, you know, it's, it, I think that will continue to be more and more of an issue as people link um, actual terrorism more and more to what they're, what's out there on the Internet. We have time for a couple of questions from the audience. Um, there's a microphone over there if um, folks would like to use the microphone. Um, and if you could just identify yourself um, and feel free to direct questions either to the panel as a whole or to individual members. No. OK. Um, this is a question to sort of rekindle the discussion between Jeff Rosen and Professor Brooks. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm torn between the perspectives that both of you presented, and so it's a question sort of half to you and half to you, and I want to. Um, you could flip a coin. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> you were presenting the, the case of preventive detention as one which involved fundamentally, a which involved fundamentally people who haven't done anything. That's your quote. Right? Uh, but it may be that we have good reason to believe they have done something. It's just not good enough to use sufficient evidence to get a conviction or proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And we may have preponderance of the evidence to believe that they have done something, but not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So what would you say to preventively detaining those people? And then, Professor Rosen, you look to security, national security courts providing a better alternative to uh, the military commissions. But I'm not sure why you think that it's going to be more uh, acceptable politically. You mentioned one reason, which was the international community might be brought in to establishing that, which might help. But if you're still going to be creating a system for preventive detention and using non-standard means of achieving commit, uh, yeah, convictions, I wonder if the taint that's associated with military convictions won't just transfer directly over. Um, no, I, I think one of the reasons that this stuff is complicated is because there are sort of two different legal paradigms at, at issue here, one of which is the law of armed conflict paradigm, which, which certainly that paradigm does assume that if you capture an enemy combatant that you can detain them until the conflict is over. Um, then there's the criminal law, you know, whether or not they have committed a crime, that's a totally separate issue. You can, you can, they could be an enemy combatant who you detain who has also committed a crime for which you could try them, but, but separate issue. You could just, you know, if, say, for, you know, think about ordinary prisoners of war, right? You could just hold them until the conflict's over. Um, and that in, is obviously a form of preventive detention in the, in the law of armed conflict paradigm. You know, U.S. has German prisoners during World War II. We're hanging on to them because we don't want them to go back and fight for the Germans anymore. Um, uh, equally, you know, then the other paradigm is the criminal law paradigm. And in the criminal law paradigm, the, the ordinary domestic criminal law paradigm, you don't get to do that. You know, we have evidentiary rules. We have sort of fruit of the poisonous tree concept. Uh, you know, we just say, look, yes, there are some costs. You, you might let go some people who are bad people who might go out and do bad stuff. But, you know, the cost to society, the cost to the system, the cost to the rule of law of holding people you know, based on insufficient evidence or tainted evidence or what have you are just too high. And, and I think, you know, terrorism does, does present conundrums because it's, you know, it's a little bit of this and it's a little bit of that and it's not quite regular traditional conflict, but it's also not quite regular traditional crime. So, you know, it does present a lot of novel issues. For me, though, it does come down to, you know, expand your, expand your focus. You know, it's, it's, you know, it's what we, you know, what economists call the externalities. You, that, that at some point, even in ordinary wars, you know, that there are prisoner exchanges, you know, and things like that, where you say, you know what, it's just not doing us any good to keep these guys. The price is too high. There's something else that we want to achieve that's more worth it. You know, and I think that with, the, with this actually pretty small number, the absolute, we're talking about 50 or 60 or 70 people here, in this category, that it, do, it does really come down, you know, I don't, I don't dispute factually, you know, that there are some category of guys at Guantanamo, Guantanamo who if I knew all about them, you know, I would completely agree, boy, these are nasty guys, and first chance they get, they probably are going to do their darndest to hurt U.S. interests. You know, that said, you know, I think that you, you do just have to balance against the harm it does us to keep holding on to them, which I think at this point, at this point, after so many years, is, is so much greater than the gains we get from keeping them, especially when we and every friendly intelligence agency in the entire world knows pretty much all there is to know about them. I think it's a great question, and it's really hard to know. Can we imagine a system of preventative detention that would have national and international legitimacy. So there are some forms of preventative detention that U.S. courts have already blessed of the uh, insane, people with infectious diseases, child molesters, even immigrants who are deportable but whose home countries won't take them. But all of those are controversial and uh, it's not obvious that people would buy the analogy. The system of preventive detention in Britain and uh, in Europe seems to have some legitimacy, especially now that uh, there's review by the European Court of Human Rights, so some form of judicial review is important and some kind of international uh, agreement to it might help. Congressional approval, I think, is the most important uh, political uh, 
boost for the whole thing, combined with a president who has some sort of international legitimacy. So whether it's Obama, Clinton, or McCain, if you come in as part of a package, you say we are closing Guantanamo, we're forbidding, we're forbidding torture, we're uh, carefully examining the status of each of these people. They have to get new hearings every six months. The president has to sign off on each of them. I completely agree with you, and, and certainly with Rosa convinced me early on. If the, the thought is this is going to be detention forever, it's not going to have legitimacy. And that means that there has to be some account of what's going to happen after a whole bunch of six month periods have expired. Uh, but uh, at the very least, I, your question gets to the hard it gets the hard questions for both of us. If you assume that this category of dangerous people exists, uh, this seems to be the best way of dealing with them, uh, better than the alternatives. And you could really, if, if the, uh, you know, you, you might even. Be, I wonder if, in a decent political climate, you could have a system that even the ACLU signed off on. Uh, and if anyone was going to ensure that that happened, it would have to be uh, Neil, for whom we're, who we're honoring today and who proposed this uh, system. I, I imagine that with support from uh, uh, respected uh, liberals and moderates like him and others, you actually could get some bipartisan agreement for this. It doesn't. I've never needed a microphone in my entire life, so you should be fine. Um, I, this also probably goes to you, Mr. Rosen. Uh, a similar question in the idea of you speak that uh, the military commissions are almost, have lost their legitimacy, and you, you argue for a national security court. And I just don't see, again, why it would have any legitimacy that, uh, like uh, uh, Judge Cook was saying earlier, that we wouldn't, the only way to get it would be to put in so many of the procedures that are already in our federal courts. And why would we create something out of whole cloth that might not work either? Again, good uh, challenge and worth uh, thinking hard about. So it's not the case that specially created courts don't have legitimacy. The FISA court, especially for its day, was actually quite respected. And uh, it may have had uh, technological challenges as communications changed. But basically, uh, that's done pretty well in monitoring uh, international as opposed to domestic surveillance. So for me, that's a model of how you can create a system out of whole cloth that has legitimacy. But then you say, wouldn't you have to give so many of the procedures of the UCMJ or something like that, you might, that you might as well just have ordinary court martials. Uh, and I guess I'll, I, I defer to people who know much more about this than I do, like, like Neil and, uh, and others, that it, there, there's a category of cases that it would be helpful to dilute the rules for, about classified information and access to lawyers uh, for a time after uh, being held. In other words, there's, there's actually some point to it. And if that's the case, and the compromises you make are not deviating all that much, that they're just small deviations from both uh, federal court rules and even military rules, and it's endorsed by the international community and by Neil and the ACLU and Congress and President uh, Clinton and all that, then, again, I think it could work and it could uh, uh, have some sort of uh, legitimacy. <laughs> Um, ra rather than be a, a dead horse, by the way, I'm Steve Lott at American University. Um, I guess m my question goes sort of towards like a different tack. We talk about the role of the courts, and yet, and we've talked about how uh, the Supreme Court has been active, but we haven't actually talked about what they've said. Um, and it strikes me that the conversation over proposed national security courts has taken place entirely, um, um, I don't want to say with no, with no uh, reflection on that, but sort of without sort of harking back to um, the things that the plurality says in Hamdi, uh, the things that the majority says in Hamdan. And I guess one of my questions is, it seems like the, the court in these cases has tried to draw distinctions that the policy debate isn't drawing. Um, right? So for example, in Hamdi, Justice O'Connor um, limits the scope of the detention authority in the AUMF to those captured in the, in the context of active combat operations in Afghanistan, uh, which by the way would eliminate a large chunk of the people who haven't held his enemy combatants. Um, right? and, in, and, and in both Hamdi and Hamdan, the plurality majority say that the AUMF actually incorporates the laws of war, uh, which presumably would mean it would exclude people who aren't subject to the laws of war. Right? So I guess the question is, is it the distinction that Professor Brooks alluded to uh, between the sort of the law of war paradigm and the, and the preventive detention paradigm actually critical? Um, and shouldn't we actually be uh, trying to be much more careful to distinguish between those who are caught in traditional paradigms, uh, right, and who are therefore subject to things that look familiar to us, um, and those who fall into, the, into the, the sort of the amorphous territory of international terrorists captured not by the military in Afghanistan, 
um, but on the streets of Sarajevo, uh, where the rules might be different, where the relevant cons policy considerations might be different, and also where the constitutional questions might be different. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's take one final question, and I've <laughs> I was gonna I was gonna end it with with that, but we need to continue this I think a little bit more to have some more wrap up. So this will be our last question. Well, I just, I think there are a lot of circumstances where we have um, information that is classic hearsay in the sense that, uh, you know, a um, uh, detainee is, is detained abroad, interviewed by an intelligence officer of a foreign government, and then he turns around and repeats to our FBI agent what he, what he was told by a detainee and that that's not going to come in in the U.S. courts um, uh, in, or, in the ordinary circumstances, unless we can come up with an exception, obviously. But that kind of material is something that we'd want to have available to us, um, at least as part of our case. I mean, there's obviously issues of, of the weight that that can be accorded and all that kind of thing. Um, so I, I think... You know, yeah, there are exceptions to the rules of hearsay, and, and we uh, certainly uh, take proper advantage of them. But I, I think what I'm talking about is something more substantial, particularly when you're dealing with foreign governments and evidence collected by foreign governments where they're not showing up in the United States to testify or for any other reason. Um, and on the National Security Court, I mean, I think it's, a, it's, it's an important point for you to raise because in my conception of National Security Court, it would be a permanent thing. Uh, it wouldn't be simply set up for the limited purpose of dealing with uh, the, the detainees at Gitmo. And um, it would be there because tomorrow we'll grab somebody and the day after that we're going to capture somebody and we're going to need to have um, this kind of set up on into the future. I mean, it would be terrific if we could say no more. We don't need to do this anymore. But my assessment is that that's probably not coming anytime soon. And so the, the, the way we get around the concerns that you express are uh, through, you know, setting up procedures that will permit it. I mean, I I think everybody's conception of the National Security Court still is that, that nearly all of the proceedings are going to be in public. And um, there still will be a federal judge uh, presiding over things. So I, I guess I would have, um, uh, maybe I'm naive, a fair amount of confidence that that wouldn't quickly devolve into a court uh, for, for prosecuting political prisoners. I think it's a very strong challenge. It's a good one to end on. And it becomes all the more acute when you realize that people like uh, Professor Katyal and uh, Professor Goldsmith have insisted that the same rules apply to citizens and aliens alike for equal protection purposes. So you say, why isn't this the risk of 
uh, Jose Padilla's into the future where American citizens can be plucked off the street or out of the uh, Chicago airport and detained indefinitely with the blessing of this national security court. The solution, I gather, is extremely rigorous definitions of the conditions under which people can be detained. I, I won't presume to uh, come up with them uh, here, except that Rosa Brooks's distinction between the law of war and so forth is important. Uh, having some kind of need to have made uh, uh, adherence to the enemy and coming to the United States with the purpose of I, I might uh, help in uh, some form, but what, what you uh, without presuming to uh, solve the problem, what you suggest is not only would you need frequent review, but very, very uh, rigorous uh, definition of what you could be detained for. And if in the end, and maybe in the spirit of bipartisanship that's characterized this panel, this good question, Rosa, makes me think, well, you know, uh, you might, maybe you'd decide, still you'd need a national security court for the status uh, tribunal determinations and also for trying the people you're going to bring to criminal trials as opposed to the flawed Guantanamo commissions. But if you decided that this, this third category that we've been debating of uh, indefinitely detained enemy combatants might run the risk of uh, turning into some kind of uh, uh, a political uh, prisoner category, maybe I might change my mind after all. So good question and thank you for that. Um, yeah, I, I guess the, the, one, the last comment I would just throw out on, on all of these issues um, uh, is really it's not a legal comment at all. It's, it's a national security comment. Uh, you know, that we're, we're talking about national security law challenges for the next administration. And I, and I think that the, you know, all of these are really tough issues. And, and you know, it's not just that Republicans and Democrats disagree. It's that, it's that you know, within... You know, civil libertarians disagree. You know, intelligence community people disagree. These these, these are tough. Um, they're going to stay tough. Technologies are going to change. Uh, you know, the, the the shape of the threats that we're facing are going to change. These these conversations are going to get tougher in ways that we're not even expecting. Um, but I think that the you know the for us as lawyers, the the toughest thing to keep in mind is that you know we like the law because we're lawyers. It's it's what we're good at. Um, but we, we need to keep in mind that there, there, there's a bundle of questions which we're really good at answering, like, can we do this legally? Um, you know, would it help us go after this particular guy or that particular guy or this actual or hypothetical categories of persons? Um, but, but, you know, it seems to me that the big picture, which we lose sight of at our peril, is that national security law is about our national security. And there can be some legal things that we do that might be legally permissible, might be smart in terms of going after certain categories of persons, but that in terms of the overall optics end up actually undermining our national security interests in terms of the impact they have on allies and getting cooperation from friendly states, in terms of the impact they have on uh, moderate Muslims in other parts of the world, et cetera, et cetera. And, and that, so this is, I guess, just a plea for, for those of you in the audience who work on these issues and think about these issues, that that has got to be part of our metric as well. That's not always what we're asked to do. Sometimes we're asked very specific questions. Can we do this legally and so forth? But that, you know, the, 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 the bottom line is not can we do it. The bottom line is, in fact, does it, does it end up making, it, making us safer? And if the answer is, yeah, we could do it and we could lock up this guy or these 20 guys or these 500 guys and it would be legal and it would satisfy rule of law requirements but it would end up you know being a recruiting poster for al-qaeda for the next three centuries it might not be such a smart idea all right we'll end things on that note i'd like to very much thank all of our panelists this was a great discussion And uh, just in terms of logistics, our next event is the investiture and inaugural lecture for Professor Kachal, which is over across the courtyard in uh, McDonough Building in the Hart Auditorium. That begins at 4 o'clock. So thank you all for coming. Thanks, Justin. Nice, nice meeting, meeting you. you. It's a good defense. <laughs> <laughs>